Are you looking for truth from God's word that you can understand and apply to your life? You'll find it today on Make It Clear with Dr. Stan Pons, Bible teacher and president of Clarity Christian College, formerly known as Florida Bible College. Listen now as Stan makes it clear. Secondly, we're going to go to the Lord and we're going to say to the Lord, thank you for what you've given to us. And as we give it to the Lord and say thank you, what we're really saying is, Lord, you are in control and whatever you do is still good. So this is good. Now hear what I'm about to say. Things that will happen in your life, in my life, they may hurt us because things do hurt. Those circumstances will hurt. And sometimes it is God's will that God permits us to go through that hurt. But here's the phrase. He doesn't harm us. Harming is when there's a permanent damage forever that we cannot get out of that. Now we may not be able to get out of a circumstance, but it won't harm us spiritually. Because God will not allow the external things that Satan do to harm us spiritually. Now if we choose to go the way of the world and buy into Satan's plan and the secular worldview and get out of our will of God, then it will harm us. But God himself permitting this in our life, he may permit the hurt, but he will not permit the harm. Maybe an illustration might help for a moment, all right? Let's say for just a moment that my good friend, Pastor Dennis, had an infected appendix. Now, there are two people that could do surgery on Dennis. One is going to be a surgeon who is skilled in internal medicine. The second person is me. Don't laugh. We both could do it. I have a pen knife. They use a knife. If he lays down and doesn't wiggle too much, I can make sure that I can get that open and Somewhere inside of him, I'm sure there's an appendix, and I hope I'll find it. Maybe it'll be red. It might be a little puffy. I don't know. It might grab his liver or something, but I think I'll grab his appendix. Now, here's where I'm going with this. Whether it's the medical doctor or me, we both will hurt Pastor Dennis. Those of you that have gone through surgery, even if you've been um, uh, anesthetized, I almost said euthanized, and that's not the right word, anesthetized, you are relieved of the pain until all that anesthesia wears off. So whether the medical doctor does it or I do the surgery on my friend, he's going to hurt. But here's the big difference. The big difference is when the doctor does it with him, the doctor is going to help his healing process. Since I don't know what I'm doing, I'm going to hinder the healing process. So I'm going to harm my dear friend. As much as my motives would be right, I would still harm him. With a medical doctor, we'll help him. Now you put God on the throne, God will permit things to happen to you that will bring hurt, whether it's financial or relational, in some measure, it will hurt. So don't deny the hurt, don't, don't um, ignore the hurt, but at the same time, don't blame God for the harm, because there is no harm in that. Because listen, the rest of the story is this, if Pastor Dennis's appendix would not be removed, he will die. And so that hurt is only getting him to a better position in his life where he will overcome that illness and become better than he was before. And so again, when God allows circumstances to come into our life, he too says to be thankful, to rejoice through all of this, and at the same time, to continually lean on him. So when the doctor comes in to see you, Pastor Dennis, and he tells you don't run around, don't play football, don't play basketball for a while, eat the right stuff, you listen to his advice, you talk to your doctor, and you'll be the best you can be. And as I continue to talk to the Lord, as he guides me through this circumstance until it is over, and my question is, Lord, how can I get the most mileage for you through this circumstance so you'd get the most glory? What is that doing? Listen, listen. What that's doing is that circumstance now has moved beyond just another thing, an accident that happened in my life, to a high calling purpose of God so that God gets all the glory. So I'm wondering, and I don't want you to go tripping on me on this, but if you go back down memory lane for however old you are, and you look at all those raw deals you've gotten in life, and how perhaps you and I have fought God on all of those things, instead of just laying down, waiting for Him to do the scalpel work on us, maybe today we're still living with the scars when we fought the surgeon, the heavenly surgeon. And so while you look back over that, don't look back over that and feel guilty and feel like you're worthless and your whole life now cannot have meaning. What you do is say, all of those events are nothing more than reminders. And I have the scars as teachable lessons because that was then and this is now. And I'm now going to walk in total dependence upon a sovereign God who is also a loving God. So whatever he does, it's out of a love that no man could ever show to me. 
And so how do I handle that? Very well. We handle it through, I rejoice. God trusted me with this. I handle it with a great deal of prayer because prayer is building an intimacy with the Lord. And then finally with thanksgiving that God, Lord, I rejoice that I have this, but Lord, I'm, I'm thankful you've given this to me because the trial of my faith is more precious than gold. So you might not be going through an affliction. You might be just in a situation where you have to make just a, a choice in life. Enter in a relationship or out of one. You're not afflicted, it's just a choice. But rejoice that God has given you the opportunity to make a choice based upon Scripture. We'll be talking about that in the weeks to come. But for right now, you have that. And then now you build that relationship in prayer with Him. I'd like to talk for just a moment about a couple, a friend of mine. This friend is not new to some of you older folks that have been a part of our church. He and his wife has visited our church many times. They've stayed at the Browns home. Happened to be David and Arlene Hotelling. He now pastors Palm Springs Baptist Church. Now that's not a bad place to pastor in Palm Springs. Carol and I enjoy going there. We don't play golf or anything, but it's a nice quieter place. It's a place for us to really be away from distractions and center down on God and visit our dear friends, Arlene and David. How many of you might remember David Hotel? And anybody here remember? We got some that are through the crowd here. Well, I'd like to tell you a story that happened. David was pastoring the church. While he was pastoring there, he was also working on an earned doctorate degree from Master Seminary. In fact, he finally earned that earned doctorate degree, and he did it as the oldest graduate in the doctoral program, 15 years older than the next oldest person. So you could see this man was passionate about learning, learning God's word and taking it back to the church, a great man. Well, he was working on one of his thesis at Starbucks in Cathedral City, outside of Palm Springs, when he received a frantic phone call from his wife. His wife was still on the ground after being crushed by a truck who hit her while she was walking. She couldn't even move and all she could do is hit that one little number to get to her husband screaming in pain. He arrived before the ambulance. A few others picked her up and moved her, which they probably should not have done. She went through a most rigorous time in her life with surgeries. That happened on November 30th, 2007. Since then, she's had no less than six surgeries and she has more still ahead of her. She's had a surgery on her hip three times. She's had a surgery on both of her hands because they were crushed. Surgery on her foot. Her back and neck were so mangled but not broken that it cut off with the nerve doing damage to the rest of her body where she barely can walk with a walker. The surgery she still faces is surgery on her feet to hopefully return some of the tendons back in the right place. I've been following that saga for the last three years, working with his wife, praying for them. Some of you have been on that journey with me and with them as well. Some of you probably don't know that while this was going on and there was a limited amount of settlement, not enough to cover any of this, or all of it I should say, the church in which he pastors, the facilities was broken into and the computer system and the technology was broken into and stolen not once, not twice, three times. And by then they were able to hopefully save when the fourth time they were broken into. Four times. And this happened in less than five years. So this poor man, working on his doc graduate degree, taking care of his wife, pastoring the church, dealing with all the fallout of lost information when you lose all this, that would be all of your financial records, all of your sermon notes, all of the stuff that you'd have on your computers, you can imagine all of that. But never did this man and wife's faith ever waver. When I was writing to him a little less than a month ago, I received a letter from David, an email. I'd like to read this because it came to me the, the day of her last surgery. Now last in the series, but not last that she'll ever have. And here's what he wrote. Hi Stan, Arlene made it through surgery. It was much more difficult than we hoped for. Though surgery was to be three hours, it ended up taking from 9.30 in the morning to 2.15 in the afternoon. She finally made it to her room by 5 p.m. The hip was so worn out that they needed to add bone. So they took part of her femur and shaped it to be shaped it to become a backing for the parts so that it all fit correctly. Pray that the bones grow together. They screwed it in with four screws. Arlene is having a difficult day today, so we appreciate your prayers. She will be on non-weight bearing for the next two to three months, and then we have to start moving to work on her feet. 
We want to be able to come to Hawaii this year, but it doesn't look like it's going to work. Thanks again for your friendship and prayers. Now here's someone who's experiencing the biblical abundant life. His wife will never be the same. Never, ever be the same. I know, apart from a miracle. But really, she'll never be the same. And yet through all of that, he didn't deny the faith. He didn't walk away from the church. He kept right along because that abundant life is the life of Christ himself in him through the Holy Spirit. And he's chosen now to yield to Christ and the Spirit to have that flow out. Well, I want to show you a picture of her now. This is uh, another shot that you might see her. She's a very beautiful lady when the accident occurred. And I talked to him last night asking him to send some pictures because uh, he's on his way to a conference. They have two nurses coming in twice a day as well as a neighbor to give her shots. And so she's well taken care of and she, he'll be at a special conference in, uh, at uh, uh, Grace Church up there with John MacArthur. And so Arlene wrote me this morning. As I woke up early, there was already an email from her, and she wrote this to me, but I'd like to say that she wrote it to you. May I read this to you? And here's Arlene's own words. I hadn't planned on going to the hospital for a month starting on November 30th, 07. I had cookies cooling at home for a Christmas brunch at our house. But since my plans were changed, and I was all of a sudden surrounded by people who mostly didn't know Christ, catch that, God gave me a new plan and purpose, peace, and hope for each day. I wasn't a real victim. He gave me purpose. My job was to make sure that I encouraged each person who entered my room each day. My job was to reflect Christ. With so much work to do, I saw lots of people. I never even got the invitation sent out to my pity party. Did it hurt? Am I permanently injured? Oh, yes. But God has been faithful to me. Well, I look forward to the day that David and Arlene will be able to come so they could share their own testimony of the faithfulness of God to folks just like you and me. And so I'd like for us to perhaps for a moment just lean on what others are going through because that's their abundant life. And they're certainly to be the first ones to say, don't use me as a model. You have your abundant life scars as well. But your abundant life could be filled with rejoicing always. praying without ceasing and thanking God in all circumstances. But there's also another point because we talked about the will of God. That is the will of God. Now the rest of the stuff is important about should I buy this car, go to this school, marry that person. That's all important, but it's the day-to-day -day things of life that's the abundant life. But now I want to move to one other point and that would be God's word to you and me. You see, God's will is really made up in God's word. If I really want to do God's will, it's not whether I buy a brown car or a beige car or a white car. It's going to be, should I buy a car at all? Am I going to do it to bring glory to the Lord? Will I use my money wisely? Have I given to Him first? So there's a lot of other principles behind just what car do I buy. But there's also another part of what is God's word for me. And we're going to learn that right now. So let's look at it, if you will, with me for just a moment. And that is, don't quench the spirit. Go back to the passage. It talked about all that before. It says, this is the will of God concerning you. And then it says, do not quench the spirit. Now, it's interesting when I think of quenching. There's a couple of things that we might quench. We could quench the light. We can quench the fire. We can quench our thirst. And maybe we could, if I use the word maybe stretched out, we could quench our hunger. What it's basically doing is to take what is ever there and reducing it. All right? Now, I don't particularly like the whole phrase of quenching the fire because you put it out. And so when it says quench the spirit, some of you might think, well, I'll quench the spirit out. In other words, I'll, he'll leave me if I, if I quench him. It's really not the idea. The idea is not so much an extinguishing of it as much as it is as a reducing and minimizing the power and the influence of it. And so we might say it this way, quench the prompting of the Spirit. Now his responsibility is to teach me, no doubt. His responsibility is to empower me to do what I should do. His responsibility is to convict me for sure. But it's also to give me the promptings of what I should do. Now, most of us know what promptings are like. And it's interesting how easy we are to receive promptings of the day-to-day -day things that are the natural world that we have. For example, perhaps maybe in January you made a new uh, commitment to the Lord that you're going to lose weight or you're going to eat better or you're going to have change your lifestyle. And there you are, you're having a good day, things are going well, and you're at the mall and... 
And you walk by Cinnabons. Now, all of a sudden, how quickly we have this strong urge to say, you know, I've been really good these last couple of weeks. I can have a bite. Have you ever had a bite? It's like a bag of Lay's potato chips. Can you eat just one? You know, can you? And don't, I, I'm not pointing my finger at you because if, if I was hungry and you had me to your house and you had a big old pizza pie there, I don't know that I could have one bite, let alone one slice, you know? So I'm going to tell you that we all have those promptings. But it is interesting how that the flesh is very quick to so strongly prompt us to do that which is evil and how quickly we sometimes lean into that instead of maybe when the Lord is now speaking to us through the Spirit, reminding us in our mind through the Word to do something and now you have that prompting. And here's what we have the choice. We have the choice to say yes to God or to say no to God. And most of the time, when we are reminded of something as we're living our life, to tell the truth, to be generous, to reach out to another person, to share the gospel, invite someone to hear a message, all these are positive things that are happening. But when they are out right in front of us, sometimes we so much neglect even when he is prompting us that we don't. So, let me remind you, the Holy Spirit will prompt you to do something, and he will prompt you not to do something and one of the dangers that we have is if we say no to him and we allow the flesh then to take over and to do the things that we shouldn't or wouldn't want to do. Now why is that theologically put together? I think it's very important because to rejoice and to pray and to give thanks, we can't do that in the flesh sustainably. In order to do that, we have to have supernatural power to do that. That's where the spirit now who's in us gives us that, that ability to be grateful, to be prayerful. And to be joyful. Now he has given us that ability. But if when the Spirit is prompting us to properly respond to the circumstances of life. Because that's the will of God. And we don't respond to the Spirit's prompting. Eventually what happens is we can now not just disappoint and grieve the Spirit. We begin to quench him so much that our life now is sliding so far backwards and downward. Spiraling away from the, God, from the Lord's great power and influence in our life that maybe what we need is a message like today where there's a little bit of a wake-up call. And maybe some of you today are reminded that you're confronted with a decision that you have to make. And you're now being asked by the Holy Spirit to make sure that you make that decision from a biblical point of view for the right motives, for the glory of God, and not let your flesh take over. And you have an opportunity now because for the next couple minutes before we leave, you are facing a road that's going to go in the right direction, and the other road that's going to go in the wrong direction. And you can stop your life now and make a choice to do the right thing. Now that doesn't happen to be go to heaven or not. That's all about what a Christian needs to do. So in a moment we're going to have communion. An opportunity for you to commune with the Lord. Because He not only came to give you life, and we have the communion about that to remind us what He did for us on the cross and that He's coming back for us, but also the abundant life that He's going to be in our life moment by moment by moment right now. So maybe today would be the time for you to just say, Lord, I want to thank you for giving me eternal life. But I also want to thank you now that I have a different perspective, that you've given me the opportunity to have an abundant life, a life of rejoicing, a life of praying, a life of thanking you. And so, Lord, I want to do that because the Spirit of God is prompting and I don't want to quench the Spirit now because I know there's a whole lot more of the abundant life you have waiting for me. And so use this communion time to do that. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, you take a moment and you can think about the hotelings. I put them in front of you because I could use perhaps a biblical illustration, but some of you might think, well, those are Bible characters. They're superstars. They're, they're in the Super Bowl League. But that's not the daily person. I want you to meet that the hotelings, they're just like you and me. They put their pants on the same way you do. She puts her lipstick on ladies, perhaps like some of you do. She's just a normal lady. And she went out in the morning with her cookies waiting for a walk so that she would be using her temple and being as healthy as she could be. And then she's unsuspectingly hit by a truck. And yet, she can rejoice. Oh, I'm sure she prayed. They still are. And would really be grateful for your prayers with them. But they're also thankful. Are you there yet? At the end of our conversation, I asked David, I said, David, you've been doing this now for over three years, 38 months or so, 
Has anyone come to faith in Christ? Because I'm always thinking that, yeah, the ultimate would be that someone would come to Christ. And I, I wanted to hear that story to share with you. And he said, Stan, it's been real funny. I just talked about that with Arlene yesterday. And that would have been Friday. No one has come to know Christ as Savior. And I said, David, I want to encourage you with something. And here it is. Some people would get discouraged now because you went through all of this and no one was brought into the kingdom of God. And you'd think all this pain and distraction for all your life, for the rest of your life, has really been worthless because no one's been born again. I want you to know that as good as it would be that someone and many people would come to know Christ as Savior, you still need to rejoice if no one comes to know Christ. So this event may not be a seed for someone else's salvation, but it may be a little bit of spiritual fertilizer to help strengthen other believers. And they may be the ones that will scatter the seed of sharing the gospel. So in a way, indirectly. I didn't realize how much that encouraged him. So maybe some of you, you're willing to endure something if you later on get a special blessing. You may not. You may not even see anything for the kingdom of God. Your reward is to rejoice. Your reward is to still have intimacy through talking with him. Your reward is still to be able to say authentically, thank you God. It's still worth it all. Now for those of you that might be outside the faith, I want to encourage you that while we're encouraging Christians to be able to do this, you will never be able to do this sustainably until you've accepted Christ as your Savior. And so maybe right now you could look over your life and say, you know, I've blown it so many times. I've been mad at God. I've cursed God. I've used His name in vain. I've lied. I faked it to thinking I would make it, and I haven't. I am so outside of this whole thing. But I want God to love. I want to know that everything that's happened in my life now and forever really does count. And so I'm coming to the Lord right now. And I'm going to look to Him as the Lord who went to the cross to die and rise again. And so I'm placing my faith alone in Jesus Christ. I'm not coming to Him promising Him that I'll start this or stop that. I'm not coming to Him that I'll place my faith in Him and then do a bunch of good works so I could still have eternal life. No, I'm, I'm coming as a, as a person that needs a Savior and that I'm trusting in Christ. Is there anyone in here today that would say that today is the day that I'm going to trust Christ as the one who died and rose again for my sin and I believe He's forgiven me of it all and I have a home in heaven and the potential for true abundant life now. Pastor, would you pray for me? Now, you don't have to say anything, but I'd like to pray for you. So would you slip up your hand? Is there anyone at all that would put up their hand indicating you're trusting Christ? Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to encourage you with something. Again, I know your heads are bowed, you're tired, you're thinking, but while you're going through this, would you ask the Lord to lay on your heart someone, and you might even be able to get a copy of this message and share it with them, that might help them, you and I, we can give them some good words, but it's only going to be the Word of God and the Spirit of God that will bring the comfort of God to that person. Would you maybe take some of this and share it with them? Take your notes and sit them down. and You go through, you talk story with them with where you are. Those of you that are touching the lives of military personnel, you know they're going to have struggles. What do they do with their career when they get over? What do they do when they finally get out? What do they do now that they're injured and they've got scars and... And physical challenges. and What do families do when their life is so messed up now and their whole career track has changed? How can they rejoice? and Help them along with that. Let them know that that is the will of God to still rejoice. Lean on Him. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. It will be worth it all. Our gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you that we don't have a hope-so salvation, but we do have a no-so salvation. I thank you that, Father, that we have a no-so because you are a God who promised eternal life and will never take it away. And so, Father, the promise of life, we have that, but also the promise of abundant life. And that, Father, the abundant life that you promised to provide for us is really more contingent upon our choice. We chose to trust Christ as Savior. Now we have to choose to have the abundant life by beginning with rejoicing always, talking to you in prayer constantly, thanking you in all circumstances. And so, Lord, we're redirecting our attitudes to you because we now are remembering you are a loving, sovereign God. And so, Lord, I, I know that the pain may not be minimized. The length of the suffering may not be shortened. But, Father, the inner joy may never be removed. And we thank you for that. 
In Jesus' name, amen. This is Joe Pons, and I want to thank you for listening to Make It Clear with the teaching of Dr. Stan Pons, founder of Make It Clear Ministries and president of Clarity Christian College. Make It Clear is dedicated to taking the Word of God with clarity into every person's world. It's the support of listeners like you who make the ministry of Make It Clear possible. You can provide your tax-deductible gift to Make It Clear online by going to makeitclear.org. That's makeitclear.org. Thank you for helping us make it clear. If you would like to have Dr. Pond speak at your church or event, please email us at tellmemore at makeitclear.org. That's tellmemore at makeitclear.org. Thank you, and remember to make it clear.